So far in our analysis of waves, we've considered one object in propagation, whether it's a pulse moving down a line or we have a simple harmonic motion creating a nice constant wave in some sort of mechanism. But our next step is to wonder if we had a multiplicity of sources going on. So, for example, we could imagine we have some sort of pulse moving down our string here with some velocity v and we have a nice equation that can now explain that and how that pulse will move with time. What we don't have at the moment is a way of explaining what would happen if, let's say, down that line there was some other pulse. And let's suppose it's moving in another direction. And let's give these some subscripts so we don't say they're necessarily the same velocity. So in that case we could have two different pulses one and two, and we can describe each of these pulses separately, but what happens once they have actually arrived and they're now on top of each other? This we don't have the tools for yet. Fortunately though, what we can deal with is something fairly simple if we have what's the underlying assumption is the principle of superposition. What that means is basically that you know that we have a way of describing the position of any little bit of the rope due to one pulse. We have a position due to the pulse from this other one here. The principle of superposition is that on the rope you just add up all the different contributing sources. So in that case, once these two waves actually meet, it's basically like having one on top of the other. So this would be 1 plus 2 at that instant when they've made contact. And then some instant later, the two will become separate and they'll move on in their separate ways and just pass by each other in the end. So that's the fascinating thing then. We can simply assume then with superposition that all that we need to describe the system is just adding these two waveforms together. So this is the equation we know that can describe a traveling wave. And now we want to basically say, let's add two of them together. So let's call this one simply y1. There's one wave. And we'll now add another equation, y2, to this. And for simplicity's sake, we're going to assume they have the same amplitude, just to make our math easy here. Still sine of kx minus omega t. So this is all the same sort of wave. But we're also going to include the phase constant here. So now we have two waves, and because I have chosen to keep the minus sign here in both cases, they're both moving in the same direction. They're going to be moving at the same rate through this oscillator. The only difference is that they might be in or out of phase with each other. And what that means, it'll become a little bit more clear in a bit. But if we want to add these two together, if we want to add y1 and y2 together, well, we can uh, sub out the amplitude, and then we'll have a sine function, another sine function, with slightly different stuff inside. And if you look up some of our trig identities, that you'll be able to see that what I'm going to write here is true, that the total wave function system here we're going to have is going to be 2 times the amplitude cosine of the phase constant divided by 2 and then sine of kx minus omega t plus v our phase constant. Now in this case then when I mentioned the phase here, 
what this has is then a fairly clear thing. So the phase constant is going to be constant. It won't be changing with position or time. But what it would tell us then is that for certain values of phi, cosine of that is going to be zero. And on the other hand, for certain values of phi, you're going to have cosine of that equals one. Now, in the case where it's one, what it would be is something like this. If we were to trying to graph the wave, if this were, say, we'll say red is one, if blue, our second wave, has the same phase as the original one, if we said the phase constant phi were zero, then it would just be both waves on top of each other. And in that case, the total, which I'll have to use in black because I've run out of my color palette. Actually, no, let's try a little bit of yellow. Yellow's nice. Yeah. In that case, it would basically just be the two together, and then the amplitude would be twice as big. So, that's exactly what our equation describes here. We have two times the amplitude, and if cosine of phi is one, then it's just going to be two times the amplitude of the normal sine wave. Conversely, though, if we were to choose something a little bit different, let's make ourselves a little bit of room here and redraw this setup. But in this case, then, let's assume the phase constant were pi. So this would basically be equivalent to 180 degrees, and we'd say the phase difference between our two waves is 180 degrees. So in that case, then, our first wave, sine wave, like so. But our second sine wave is going to be quite the opposite. If you plugged in pi in there, shifting everything 180 degrees or half the wavelength, it's basically going to look like the same thing but upside down. So that's wave two now. And if that's wave two, and they're added together, what's that going to look like? Well, let's say we'll use green here for our total. Well, at any given point, we have something that's positive for one, negative for the other, and just as much, because they both have the same amplitude. So really, it's going to give us flat line. And again, that's actually what we would expect, again, from our equation here, since we see that if we put in our value of pi for the phase constant, that's pi over 2 we're putting in for cosine, and cosine of pi over 2 is 0. And so this thing would describe the wave to be flat everywhere when they're added together. So this equation is now describing two different forms the case uh, where they're in phase, and we get an even bigger wave, which we call constructive interference. And in the other case, where if they are completely out of phase by 180 degrees or pi radians, we say that's destructive interference. And with destructive and constructive, these are the best ways of describing what's going on with these sorts of waves adding together. Let's now consider one other interesting case of interference. Again, we'll have one wave described simply by the equation above here. But our second equation, we'll keep it in phase with the other one. There won't be any phase constant difference between the two. But in this case, we'll give it the same amplitude, the same wave number, same angular frequency. But let's have that wave go in the opposite direction. So by making this a plus sign here in the equation rather than a minus sign, it's telling us that the wave is traveling in the opposite direction. But since they have the same angular frequency, same wave number and all that, everything's at the same speed. We've chosen the same amplitude. Now if we choose to add these two waves together, 
Again, we're going to have to use some trig identities, but you can prove on your own and see that the total waveform here has an interesting solution where we get two times the amplitude, kind of like what we saw before, sine kx, and multiplied by cosine omega t. Now, this is a bit different. This means that if you choose some particular point on the wave, it's going to have zero amplitude no matter what. I could choose a certain value of x such that when it's multiplied by k, our wave number, that it will get sine of zero, and that will be true at any given time. And conversely, I can choose a certain value of x where it's at a maximum amplitude. And then, of course, it will go between 0 and that maximum amplitude with time. And so it'll oscillate up and down like mad versus just staying still. In this case, this wave isn't actually moving anywhere anymore. And in some ways, that kind of makes sense. If you have one wave with the same amplitude coming at another wave with the same amplitude, and if they are coming at each other with the same speed, in kind of like the same sense if you had a collision between two cars and they went bam together, they're the same mass, they have the same speed, from conservation of momentum, you'd expect them there to be no movement afterwards because the initial momentum was zero, since both of them had equal and opposite momentum. So after they collide together and stuck together, you'd have no motion to have maintained zero total momentum. So that, strangely enough, makes some sense with this standing wave formalism. So this means that you're going to have some sort of wave that it's going to oscillate up and down, down and up. And there's going to be these certain points where it doesn't move at all at any time. So these points, which I'm marking here in blue, where we never get any motion, are what we call the nodes. And because the other spots here at the maximum amplitude points are the opposite of the nodes, we call them the anti-nodes. And this then is describing our standing wave. We have points that are, the nodes themselves will never move, again, as long as we keep the same oscillations going on. And they stay in place, and now we can actually use this to describe some other features, especially when it comes to sound.